while this report has the audacity to claim that the EU always seeks to reduce the risk of escalation. No, it doesn't. We are witnessing the collapse of the post-war system instigated by the US and Europe, all to shield Israel, our outpost, from consequences. It's a rogue state vested in ensuring instability in the region and US geopolitical goals. In the last month, it's bombed Palestine, Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, all the while claiming it's the victim. And here we are today. Welcome to Savvy Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. That was the uh, incredible Claire Daly. My special guest tonight is Chris Hedges. He's an author, a journalist, and he's also the host of the Chris Hedges Report at the Real News Network. Welcome back, Chris. Thanks. So, Chris, I'm sure you have heard the news, as all of us have. Uh, yesterday, it was pretty alarming uh, that we heard that Iran has uh, attacked uh, Israel. This was, of course, a retaliatory uh, attack after Israel had bombed the Iranian embassy in Damascus. I want to hear from you. I think this is what a lot of us were afraid of. Many of us that were calling for a permanent ceasefire. It wasn't just in reference to Gaza, but also because Israel has been attacking Lebanon, Syria, you know, other countries in the Middle East as well. And we were afraid it was going to escalate to this point. What are your thoughts about the attack from yesterday? Well, so far, I would say both Hezbollah and Iran have shown tremendous restraint in the face of Israeli provocation. This attack was telegraphed way in advance. Uh, the drones are very slow moving. Um, it gave the United States, uh, Israel, the UK, other coalition partners plenty of time to prepare. I think the outcome is what Iran wanted. There were apparently no Israeli casualties. If the Israelis are to be believed, no significant damage. Uh, and uh, Iran, I, I, and I worked in Iran, they, they don't want a war with Israel. Uh, and so, and that's why they said that this was, they had ceased hostilities after this assault. I think it achieved what they wanted. It was in many ways a symbolic attack. Um, uh, and uh, how Israel responds, of course, is an unknown. And, and if Israel uh, responds aggressively, then we could be sucked into the nightmare of a regional conflict. I think that, that would initially come from Lebanon, not from Iran. Yeah, it's really interesting. So basically, Iran was sending a message uh, to Israel, so to speak. I want to get your take on this this moment from Joe Biden. Uh, of course, this is before uh, Joe Biden was uh, elected as president in 2020. He actually had predicted that Donald Trump would lead us closer to a war with Iran. I want you to hear this take here. The world has changed because of what Trump has done. And the American people, including independents and some Republicans, know how bad he is, know how much he's misrepresented, know how he's getting close to getting us in a war. I said, as the walls close in on this man, I'm worried he's going to get us to war in Iran. Unfortunately, I may have been right. The f but you see where we are now. So it just goes to show you uh, whether we have Donald Trump or Joe Biden, you know, both presidents and both uh, political parties support the state of Israel. And I, I want to get your take on that, that prediction that Joe Biden made that Trump would actually get us closer to a war with Iran. Well, the, the American intelligence and military establishment has uh, long uh, pushed away Israel, which is uh, Netanyahu has been advocating for a war with Iran going back to the administration of George W. Bush. Uh, and they don't want it uh, for many reasons. Uh, not, not least of which is because it would be a fiasco. Um, so that has been a constant. I, I think that the uh, damage done by the Trump administration was dismantling the nuclear agreement that monitored uh, weapons-grade plutonium, uh, uranium that was being produced in Iran. We know it is being produced. So. Uh, that certainly was damaging. Remember, the only country in the Middle East that has nuclear weapons is Israel. Um, and uh, uh, so, I mean, 
in many ways, the, these this kind of thing is out of the hands of uh, the Biden administration because if Israel responds aggressively, and then there's an aggressive counter response from Iran, uh, I don't think the Biden administration wants a war with Iran. Um, they can get sucked into one. So you know, Israel has always functioned as a kind of rogue state. It does what it, it wants. It has the powerful Zionist lobby. It essentially owns both parties. Biden, of course, is the largest recipient of APAC aid of any senator. Right? And he holds that record, even though he left the Senate, what, eight, 10 years ago. So um, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's really at this point up to the Netanyahu government, and um, and I don't I don't trust the judgment of the Netanyahu government, especially since Netanyahu has long called. We're talking about you know years and years long called for conflict with Iran, and of course what it, it intends to do or wants to do is suck the United States into that conflict, just like it did in Iraq. The Israel lobby, uh, Israel itself, was a powerful engine for the uh, invasion of Iraq, as it was with the uh, attacks on Libya, both of which did not turn out particularly well. That's right. In fact, uh, to that point, Joe Biden made the statement recently. Biden told BB the U.S. won't support an Israeli counterattack on Iran. So even this statement here goes to show you that even the Biden administration realizes that this could be an absolute disaster. I was talking to my dad about this uh, last night after uh, Iran responded to to Israel. And one of the things that he was telling me is just how powerful Iran's military actually is. The last thing we would want is to have any type of conflict uh, with Iran. Do you think that Israel will still respond to Iran? Because I have a feeling that Israel, because they've become, they're basically gone unchecked for so long uh, that they will try to respond. And then to your point, try to suck the U.S. into it. And I wonder what does that mean for the relations with Israel and the United States government? So during uh, the, the Gulf War, the United States pressured Israel not to respond to the Scud attacks that were fired from Iraq successfully. But that was a different government. Um, and uh, if Israel, Israel has already said that it would respond, when or how and, and what that will look like, we don't know. Uh, but it, if it is aggressive, and, and certainly Iran was provoked with the uh, Israeli airstrike on the consulate in Damascus that killed several top generals. And, uh, so, uh, you know, that, then it's just an unknown. It, it, could be, uh, it could be this kind of death spiral that nobody can control. That, that is a real possibility. Um, but again, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. At this point, all the the future of this conflict is now in the hands of the Israelis. The other point I wanted to bring up, Chris, because I know you've been to the to the region, so you're familiar with the Middle East. How are other, I guess, Arab nations, how do they feel about this? How do they feel about Iran? So, for example, you were in Egypt uh, recently. What is their take on uh, the Iranian government uh, when comparing it to Israel? It depends on the country. So, Relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran have traditionally been uh, hostile. Uh, the Baghdad government is closely allied with Iran. Uh, it, it, it depends completely on which country. So it's, it's not a uniform response. Um, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, Iran is a very large country. It has a very powerful military. It's uh, not as easily subjugated in air assaults the way Lebanon is. Um, and that is why the Pentagon has not wanted to go to war with Iran. There was heavy pressure uh, uh, by Iran after, uh, in that interim period before Obama became president, heavy pressure on the Bush administration to uh, launch airstrikes. As I understand it, the they need the U.S. Air Force because uh, Iran's air defense system is quite robust. Uh, Israel would lose a lot of warplanes trying to get into places that it, it would want to bomb. Uh, and uh, the deal then was that they wanted the U.S. to use its air force and missile system to take out the air defense systems uh, so that then they could carry out a bombing campaign. I, I suspect that any war, certainly if, 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 if it does erupt, uh, would be 
uh, an air war. Um, I, I don't see Iranian troops. They'd have to go through. It does not share a contiguous border with uh, Israel, so it would have to go through Syria, or it would fight through its proxies, Hezbollah, in Lebanon. But uh, Hezbollah has some pretty formidable capabilities in terms of missile systems that could do some real damage, which they have not used. Um, yeah, th th this could go very, very bad very fast. Where do you think this would put a country like Jordan, for example? Because I know that uh, Biden actually met with uh, the leader of Jordan. I know that the princess, uh, or excuse me, the queen of Jordan, I know she was interviewed on CNN after October 7th. What do you think those, a country like Jordan would do if this were to continue to escalate? Whose side would they be on? Would they be on the side of Israel or would they be on the side of Iran? Well, they're tacitly on the side of Israel because remember the Yemenis have blocked the sea lanes and the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Jordan have opened up a land corridor which has triggered large street protests in in Amman uh, where they're chanting we are all Hamas 60 percent of Palestinians of uh, the citizens of Jordan are of Palestinian descent so uh, but Jordan would clearly not side with Iran no Iran is considered a hostile power by Jordan why do you think Jordan is not speaking out more in reference to the support of the Palestinian people? Because the Queen of Jordan herself is Palestinian. I know she did that interview uh, with Christine Amanpour on CNN, but I do feel like uh, for quite a while they've, they've been somewhat mute in reference to speaking out support of the Palestinian people. Well, there's kind of, you know, pro forma rhetorical support, but it's because of their hostility to the Muslim Brotherhood which is also the case with Egypt, and Hamas comes out of the Muslim Brotherhood. So both for the Jordanian monarchy and for the Egyptian government, uh, there is no love for Hamas. Uh, that's why Hamas is largely based in Lebanon and Qatar. They're not based in places like Jordan or Egypt. Uh, so there's, there's always been long or historical antagonisms between uh, the monarchy and the Brotherhood, which eventually after the first intifada became Hamas in Gaza, and that's also true in Egypt. That's interesting. I also want to get your take on this as well. Uh, recently, there were attacks on humanitarian aid workers uh, in uh, Gaza from UNICEF and also uh, the World Central Kitchen. Uh, now, immediately after these aid workers from the World Central Kitchen uh, were attacked, the U.S. government, our politicians like Nancy Pelosi came out immediately and said, OK, we're willing to pause uh, financial support towards Israel uh, because these humanitarian aid workers were attacked. But obviously they did not have that response in reference to the Palestinian people that have been uh, relentlessly attacked by the state of Israel. The fact that they attacked humanitarian aid workers and the U.N. and the U.N. Security Council have not like stepped forward to seriously reprimand Israel or hold them accountable is beyond absurd to me. And I do feel like my biggest fear is that Israel, again, has they've been gone unchecked for way too long. And the fact that humanitarian aid workers that were actually in a safe zone can't deliver supplies and food uh, to the Palestinian people that need it because they're going to be attacked uh, by the IDF. It's very concerning. And I wonder what do you think is going to come from that? Do you think Netanyahu is going to remain in power? Or you feel like there's going to be more pressure uh, to get him out of there? Well, he'll remain in power as long as the conflict goes on. He's probably not, he's going to be ousted from power once it ends, which is why he has an interest in prolonging it. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, group that was attacked, these seven individuals who were killed, uh, the Central Global Kitchen, they were uh, uh, very, they had been greenlighted and supported by both the Biden administration and Israel because they were, although they don't have the logistical capacity to actually deal with a famine in Gaza, you have to remember there's a campaign to dismantle and the United States has withdrawn funding from UNRWA, from the UN agency that uh, provides relief, humanitarian relief and support to Palestinians, both in Gaza and in the diaspora. So uh, Israel has long targeted UNRWA. Uh, it, it, it made this unverified claim that members of UNRWA were 
uh, linked to the attacks of October 7th. That saw the United States. And so they send in the global central kitchen as a kind of uh, fig leaf, a kind of, it's, a, it's just a publicity stunt. Uh, the central global kitchen can't begin to cope with the, the levels of hunger and starvation that is rippling through Gaza, especially in the north. And so the anger on the part of the establishment was that Israel even killed uh, the, you know, the, the humanitarian aid group that it was using as a kind of lever uh, to discredit and dismantle UNRWA. Um, so that's what that was all about. And, and Pelosi, there will be no pause in aid at all. There isn't going to be a pause in aid. That, that's, uh, that's not going to happen, especially in an election year. Uh, Biden can't afford to alienate the very powerful Israel lobby, number one. Number two, Biden's a creature of, he wouldn't probably be in power without the credit card companies in Delaware and APAC. Well, recently, uh, Tucker Carlson interviewed a Christian uh, pastor from Israel who is also Palestinian, and this has actually caused uh, a, a roar effect, so to speak, among Christian Zionists, because now it has been kind of put on the world stage that Christian Zionists are being mistreated in Israel as well. I mean, I think a lot of us on the left already knew that. But judging by the comments from Tucker Carlson's interview, I think a lot of people on the right were not aware of that. Do you think that now that this has happened, that more Christian Zionists are now upset with Israel's activity, do you think that this is now, there could be a possibility that the left and the right could come together in reference to pushing back on the state of Israel? Or do you think that's uh, ambitious? I think that's probably ambitious. I don't think the Christian right has any moral core. Otherwise, they wouldn't support Donald Trump. Uh, the, the Christians who are being tacked are Orthodox and Catholic, primarily. Uh, they, and we had a very uh, ancient church in uh, Gaza that was bombed by the Israelis. I think 12 Palestinian Christians were killed in that attack, and several were wounded. So, uh, And Palestinian uh, Christians have been ethnically cleansed en masse out of both Gaza and the West Bank. So. For those of us who covered, I spent seven years, of course, covering the conflict for the New York Times. Well, five for the New York Times, and but I was seven years in the region. Um, they, they, we're, we're all aware, but I think that uh, you know, for the general public, there probably isn't an awareness that I think it's about ten or twelve percent of Palestinians are Christians. That, that number may have diminished as many, many Christians are leaving, um, but they've always been there. They're very ancient communities. And uh, Tucker Carlson was raising a very valid point. How will the Christian Zionists respond? Uh, I don't think they're going to turn on Trump. Uh, I, I think that they understand that if Trump is reelected, he doesn't have any ideology of his own, that that void will be filled with, I call them Christian fascists, um, and wrote a book about them called American Fascists, the Christian Right in the War in America. So I don't, I don't see them abandoning Trump, especially as it's clear, and the Heritage Foundation has published a long document, uh, essentially laying out a blueprint for a new Trump administration based on quote unquote biblical values. So I don't see them walking away from Trump. And speaking to that point, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she's another one uh, that is very hypocritical here. So she actually tweeted, pray for Israel. This was after the attack uh, yesterday. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene doesn't tell you to pray for Syria, uh, Lebanon, <laughs> Gaza, but all of a sudden when it's Israel, and particularly these politicians that take money from the Israeli lobby, all of a sudden when it's Israel, you have to pray for them, but none of the other people in these surrounding countries that are attacked by Israel. And a lot of people were actually uh, calling her out uh, on Twitter and they were saying, what happened to focusing on America first? And I think uh, these groups that are on uh, Twitter, like Track APAC, they have actually been, you know, exposing a lot of the politicians that take APAC money. Do you think that more people are now starting to see, particularly those on the right that supported people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, are now starting to see that these politicians that said they were for America first are actually Israel first? That's a hard question to answer. I don't hang out with a lot of those people. Um, uh, and I haven't been, I, I have reported, uh, I mean, actually a chapter in my book, uh, America, the Farewell to Arm with the three percenters. I mean, it was kind of, uh, you know, it was uh, right out of the fascist playbook. It was actually outside of 
Binghamton, New York in the woods around a bonfire with a bunch of guys with weapons. So uh, I, I think they're kind of impervious to rational argument. I, I, I don't think that this is a rationally based movement. It's an emotionally based movement. Um, so I think it's kind of impenetrable. I mean, that's what creationism is about. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it, uh, but it fills an emotional need. So I think people have written about that, that, that there can be all sorts of contradictions, as you pointed out, within the movement, but because it, it, it satisfies an emotional need, it doesn't really matter. That's a good point. Now, Chris, I know that you were recently uh, in the UK for the Assange uh, hearing. I do want to hear an update about his particular situation. I'm not sure if you were able to revisit London after, uh, again, after that hearing, but I think people want to hear where or if this could possibly go in reference to uh, Julian Assange. Right. So I did sit in on that two-day hearing in the High Court in London. Um, it was, it's always interesting because you, you pick up all sorts of details that you're not going to pick up if you're not there. The prosecution refused to give the two judge panel the assurances that number one, Julian would not be subjected to the death penalty. And number two, uh, that he would have first amendment rights. He's an Australian citizen, of course. And the judges pushed back on that. So it's very clear after those two days that, uh, two things were going to happen. The United States was going to give those assurances to the judges, i.e. say he will not be subjected to the death penalty and he will be given First Amendment rights. If those assurances weren't given, uh, then it was very clear that the appeal process would go forward. Those are minor technical issues. They're not substantial issues. Julian, Julian won't be able to issue a, uh, or mount a uh, public defense kind of argument that this is for the public good, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that was clear. Uh, we also know that there is contact between uh, the government attorneys in the United States and Julian's attorneys over a possible plea deal. Um, there have been reports that he could plea out on a misdemeanor charge. Um, I hear that it's kind of now stuck around one uh, particular issue, but I don't know what it is, but we know that that is happening. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into the Biden comment. Um, the fact that we're considering it doesn't mean he's considering it. Um, but there is all that movement going. If the United States uh, does not offer those insurances, assurances, then I think it's pretty clear that he will be allowed to appeal. That may be, in terms of the U.S. government, the best decision because it, it will mean he will still be locked up in a high security prison where he's been for five years. Um, even though he's not been charged with committing a crime uh, because he didn't commit a crime. Um, uh, but that keeps him locked up and you don't have to deal with the extradition during an election year. Interesting. Uh, one more quest uh, question for you, Chris, because I know you got to get out of here. Uh, 2024 presidential election. A lot of us uh, saw the video that went kind of viral of you on Twitter uh, at the Worker Strike Back Summit uh, when you you know, suggested that Dr. West run with the Green Party. A lot has changed since then. Uh, Dr. West left the Green Party and decided to run as an independent. Uh, Jill Stein uh, is running with the Green Party uh, for their, and I think, believe she's winning pretty much the nomination in almost every state uh, where they're having uh, the nomination decided. What do you uh, think now, uh, going into the 2024 election? Right now, Jill Stein, out of the third party and independent candidates, she does have the most ballot access. Uh, what is your take on this? Because again, the reality is Joe Biden and Donald Trump both support state of Israel. Uh, and I'm, me personally, I'm looking for to vote independent or third party for someone who actually understands uh, that we need to pull away from this idea of the Zionist movement, et cetera, and that the Palestinian people need to have some type of um, so, some some type of self determination. They need to be free uh, from Israel's grasp. Do you think that now could be the time? Because Joe Biden is losing support between African-American voters, Latino voters, and uh, younger voters as well. Do you think now could be the time that people could actually break the duopoly? Well, I'm not going to vote for Biden. I mean, genocide is a moral issue. It's not a political issue. I have had one friend who was killed and several others who have disappeared. They're presumably dead. We haven't heard from them in weeks. So uh, I, I don't see how we can 
we have to make, uh, make any government that supports genocide, we have to punish them. And the way we punish it is withholding support. I, of course, don't want Trump as president, uh, but I think uh, I can't. Uh, I can't go. I can't. That's a line I can't cross. Um, I did was very instrumental in getting Cornell into the Green Party, and it was, as you point out, uh, over ballot access because I worked for Ralph Nader. I was a speechwriter, and I understand how difficult it is to get on the ballot. Both parties conspire to block third parties from getting on the candidate, and they have all sorts of nefarious ways to do it state by state. Uh, and uh, I don't think Cornell, I think he's only on the ballot in Alaska and Oregon, last I heard. Um, it's really, really tough. Um, and uh, I, he, I, was, I was not here over the summer. I was doing Julian Assange events in Europe. But um, uh, so I wasn't part of that decision to walk away. But I worry that he's just not going to be on any significant states. And that is the benefit of a Green Party candidate is that they probably will be able to get on a significant number of ballots. And so we'll at least have that option. Yeah, that's right. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. I know you got to get out of here. Great. Thanks, Savvy. Thanks for doing it. All right. All right, guys, that was Chris Hedges. We will make sure we clip that tomorrow for you. So you got an update about the Assange situation because Chris was actually there in the UK. So I wanted to make sure we touched on that uh, and a lot about Israel and Iran. So, yeah.